Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship at Smith Boys of Congregational Church, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. Or invited to check in on social media if you're so inclined. Let us know where you are and why you're here. It's a good place to be. We're a little bit cooler in Red Hall than we would be in the sanctuary. So look at it. But I'm still making the plug for the uh, high-tech personal cooling devices, which are in this box here. If you need one, grab one. Please return them to the box afterwards. Uh, also extend a big welcome to Jeff Dunn, who this is his final Sunday as our guest musician. So thanks for all you've done. For. The big church yard sale will take place on September 10th, so please drop off your donated items for sale today after worship and also next Sunday following the worship service. And we're still looking for volunteers to help out the day of the sale and for sorting beforehand and, and toting and lifting and displaying and all that good stuff. Uh, there's a clipboard on the table with the yellow tablecloth. Please feel free to sign up and volunteer your time for the yard sale. Homecoming Sunday is September 11th, the next day, at Ned's Point. We return to our 10 a.m. time for worship, and we're encouraged to bring our own picnic lunch, but there will be games. There will also be ice cream from Oxford Creamery uh, who will be served to us at, at Ned's Point. So again, September 11th, 10 a.m., bring your own picnic lunch. Please continue to read the bulletin and spiritually speaking email newsletters on the way to serve and for more announcements from our church council boards, ministry teams. And also look for a very special email kind of come out in the next day or two. And it's regarding the stakeholders meetings. If you read spiritually speaking this past Thursday, you know what a stakeholder is. And if you are in the sound of my voice, you are one. Yeah. A stakeholder is someone who is concerned about the ministry and the future of Manitoba Congregational Church. Even you folks watching on video are stakeholders. So there will be special meetings of small groups here at church following worship on September 18th and October 16th. And you can either sign up for those by email, by replying to the email that will be sent out in the next couple of days. Or I'm going to try to make some sign-up sheets as well to post on the wall over here uh, that people can sign up for those stakeholders' meetings as well. But they're very important for our transition team to gather information about people's feelings, desires, visions, hopes, dreams for this very dear place to many of us, this church. So now let us worship the God who provides healing and wholeness. Thank you. 
Would you join with me in our responsive call to worship? Gather before God, the Holy One. Come together to listen to God's voice. The Word of God shakes the earth. We expect to be changed by God's message to us. This is God's holy day, a time to lay aside narrow interests. We will honor God in thought, word, and deed. Let us delight in the word and works of our God. We will join together in prayer and praise. Our gathering hymn this morning is in the New Century of Hymnal number 31, All Things Bright and Beautiful. together our prayer of invocation. We are known to you, gracious God, better than we know ourselves. You have given us life and renewed our spirits. You have carried us to the heights and dwelt with us in life's depths. You are our hope and our trust. Touch us here and now, for you are far beyond our reach. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. The story of the first sin and its punishment. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and that they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The servant tricked me. And I ate. So ends the reading. Naughty, naughty Adam, naughty, naughty Eve, bad, bad serpent. 
Back to them in a moment. <laughs> the evil queen transformed into a witch in the Snow White story. She brought one of these bad boys for Snow White to bite into, and that caused her to fall asleep until love's first kiss woke her up. These things, these fruit, have been around in a lot of stories and done a lot of damage. And we know that when the serpent explained to the man and the woman that they would not in fact die if they ate the fruit, we know what fruit it was, right? What was it? Not the apple. No one. Doesn't say. In art, in Hollywood, in storytelling, we have Adam and Eve eating an apple, and the Bible does not say apple. So I'm here to tell you that we have to separate popular culture from what Scripture actually says. Snow White ate an apple. It does not say what fruit it was that Adam and Eve ate. As believers, as followers of the way, as those who find the Bible to be holy scripture and literature, we have to remind ourselves that what we know may not be so. We have to read what the Bible says, not what we think it says. For example, Christmas time, there's a lot of this scripture mixed with, mixed with popular culture, mixed with tradition, and all it's jumbled in one big story as opposed to being separate narratives in the Gospels. For example, we sing the Christmas carol, We Three What? Kings. Kings. Does the Bible say there were three of them? No. There were magi from the east. So we three kings, there may or may not have been three, and they probably were not kings. So the we part was right because they were plural, but aside from that, that 66% of that song is wrong. What we know may not be so, we have to read the words in the Bible and not rely on what we think it says. Think of me for a minute about angels, about angels. We have these beautiful images of these holy beings with harps and with wings, and it's Hollywood and literature. Nowhere absolutely in the Bible does it say that angels have halos or harps or wings. They're God's messengers. That's art. That's fiction. We know the biblical saying, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Not from the Bible, it's from the Anglican Book of Prayer. Joseph, whose brothers kidnapped him and sold him into slavery. He was his father, Jacob's favorite son. And how did we know that Jacob loved his son Joseph? What did he give him? A coat of many colors right? That's Broadway. That's not the Bible. What the Bible actually says is a coat with sleeves. A coat with long sleeves. And what that represents is that you, you can't do any work out, out in the, the fields if you have long sleeves. So it was saying that he was you know, the lazy one. The one that got, he got to lounge around and didn't have to work because he was given a beautiful coat with long sleeves. Doesn't say many colors. Uh, where does uh, the devil hang out? Where does he live? Hollywood. <laughs> it's not hell. <laughs> Nowhere in the Bible does it say the devil dwells in hell. That was first written in Milton's Paradise Lost. It's not from the Bible. As we saw, the serpent in today's story was representative of Satan, okay? We saw Satan as a serpent. In the Bible, the devil is very much active in the affairs of human beings right here on earth and does not live in hell. We could probably even have a discussion on what is hell according to the Bible. 
uh, because there's a lot of different understandings that are put forth. Great statesman Abraham Lincoln, in one of his most famous speeches, said, a house divided against itself cannot stand, right? He was quoting scripture. He didn't make that up. Jesus said that. But it's attributed to Lincoln because people don't read their Bibles. So all we're saying, it wasn't an apple in the garden. There weren't necessarily three wise men, and they certainly weren't kings. We know things about angels. We know things about the coasts. Joseph War. So this isn't a pop quiz as much as it's just a reminder that what we know may not be so. Amen. in local synagogues on the Sabbath, he often drew large crowds. He was also pretty well known for upsetting the religious leaders in his area. Today's gospel lesson is a twofer because he does both things. Now, the laws of God passed to the chosen people through Moses were the guidebook for their community, the Deuteronomic rules for life found in the Torah not only meant as ways to honor God, they were the threads that held the fabric of society together. Many of these laws pertain to the Sabbath. How far you could or could not travel, what you could or could not eat, what energy you could or could not expand and work. We heard all that earlier this summer when we explored the commandment regarding remembering the Sabbath, keeping it holy. Today we find Jesus on the Sabbath, breaking the rules and healing a woman. Listen for the word of God. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. 
Come on those days and be pure, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to get it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame. And the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. May God add understanding to our hearing of this word. Amen. People have been breaking rules since forever. And according to scripture, people have been breaking rules since there were, well, people. We heard the story a bit earlier about Adam and Eve's rule breaking in the Garden of Eden. God said, here's the thing, you can live in paradise and have whatever you want. Just stay away from that one tree. Don't touch it and don't dare eat its fruit. So what do they do? They eat the fruit. When God calls them to account for their actions, the guy blames the lady, and the lady blames the snake. All are cursed. God votes them off the island. That's true. But he gives them some clothes because he still cares about them. The first rule in the history of history broken. Society has and needs rules. I've been told by reliable sources that I do not have pet peeves, I have a zoo full of peeves. <laughs> like people who park in handicapped spots when they don't need to. Or those who jump or cut in line. This even happened to me when I was in line to get into the Vatican. Religious pilgrims, indeed. Do people break rules or laws because they feel entitled? Like the people in front of me at the express line at the store. There I am with my one protein, a veggie, a carb, and perhaps a little dessert for the evening meal, and I get them to 15 items or less, Lane and Shaw's or Stay and Pay. And the person unloading their entire basket in front of me is perhaps clueless. Or could it be that they're them, so it's okay? I usually restrain myself when I want to ask them which they failed in school, math or reading. <laughs> Breaking the rules. Where did this sermon title come from? Well, we display the coming Sunday sermon title on our church lawn sign on what I have learned is called the Wayside Pulpit, for some reason. Cool. But it faces the stop signs on Barstow and Church. People regularly go out of turn or roll right through the stop signs there. And it's not as if there are a school, a library, a program for seniors, and two churches on the block or anything. People usually blow the stop signs because they're looking at some electronic gadget in their hands, which is breaking another rule. Anyway, I just wanted people to think about rules when they saw our sign. I'm at a place a cop didn't give me a thumbs up while driving by. <laughs> but society has and needs rules. Religion has rules too. And we all break them. That's where the term sin comes from. Sin literally means missing the target. We've taken it to mean doing things that are harmful to self or others or God. Maybe we are a bit entitled as believers to think, well, after all, it's me, so it's okay. We also know that there are many religious rules in Jesus' time. And he broke many of them. He healed on the Sabbath. He picked grain on the Sabbath. He ate meals with tax collectors and prostitutes. He touched lepers and dead people. 
He associated with known Samaritans and other Gentiles. He spoke out against the religious leaders of his people. He forgave sins. He claimed to be the Messiah. All of these things were very much against the rules of his religion. Now, was he operating out of a sense of entitlement like many of the rule breakers today? I don't think so. So we may ask, why then did Jesus break all those rules? One reason I think is that he was showing us through his actions that some rules are outdated or simply unjust. That it's okay to break the rules when God demands it. Now I'm not talking about having too many items in the line at the grocery store or even about coming to a complete stop at the intersection with the pretty red octagons. Sometimes to be Christian witnesses, we need to break rules in order to change the ones that are bad. Some Christians, for example, were some of the first to speak out against slavery in our country. Some were on the front lines of the civil rights movement. I'm extremely proud to share my first two names with Martin Luther King Jr., Reverend and Dr. He was every bit as much of a Christian minister as he was a leader for racial justice. In fact, I'll be teaching a class on racial justice at church this fall, so stay tuned. There was a famous photograph by Horace Cork, Cork which shows a group of white and black integrationists in the former Monson Motor Lodge swimming pool on June 18, 1964. The photo was connected to the St. Augustine movement, named to the town in Florida, where it took place. Lots of peaceful protests and demonstrations were responded to with violence, which led to more and more complicated protests. Well, on June 11, 1964, Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested for trespassing at the Monson Motor Lodge after being asked to leave its segregated restaurant. Well, this and other incidents helped spur on a group of protesters, black and white, to jump into the pool as a strategically planned event to end segregation at motel pools. The pool at this motel was designated whites only. Whites who paid for motel rooms invited blacks to join them in the motel pool as their guests. The swim-in was planned by King and two associates. Well, the famous picture is of the motel manager, Jimmy Brock, in an effort to break up the party, poured a bottle of muriatic acid into the pool, hoping the swimmers would become scared and leave. Rules. But now there are U.S. Olympic swimmers who are athletes of color, who bring home the gold, like Simone Manuel, who won the gold medal for the 100 meter freestyle in Rio. She was the first African-American female Olympic gold medalist in swimming. As a young black woman, we don't have to go too far back in history to a time when she would not have even been allowed in the same pool with white people. From who swam in what pool, or drank out of which water fountains, or who rode in what seats on a bus. Rules were broken because they needed to be changed. Some rules are just wrong. It wasn't until just a few years ago that all 50 states finally allowed LGBT couples to adopt children. Mississippi was the last hope. And as you know, it also used to be illegal for women to vote in the United States. It used to be the case where children as young as 10 years old used to work in factories. Bad, bad rules. Why did Jesus break the rules about the Sabbath? Those rules were outdated and unjust. The sure answer is this, Jesus saw a need and addressed it. Why? 
because someone needed to be healed. Because someone needed to be healed. Back to the Garden of Eden. Now, if you don't subscribe to the daily devotionals from the United Church of Christ, I strongly recommend that you do. UCC.org. Pretty easy. UCC.org. You click on the subscription to the daily devotionals, and then they will be emailed to you daily. Friend and colleague, Reverend Lillian Daniel, offered this story as her modern take on the Adam and Eve eating the forbidden fruit and being expelled from the garden story. She writes, A mother makes a cake for a special occasion and she tells her two kids, That cake is not for you. It's for the church supper tonight. So don't touch it. All day long the kids walk in and out of the kitchen looking at the beautiful cake with its creamy frosting, pulling them in like a magnet. They sniff it, breathing in the smell of vanilla and chocolate, imagining how it might melt on their tongues. Why not just dip a tiny finger into the frosting for a little taste? One kid does it. When a sister sees his fingerprint, she thinks she might as well dip her finger in too. And after that, a little of the cake shows through, and her brother suggests they may as well have a little forkful, as they try to, and will try to patch up the damage later. But once they take a forkful, they have to have another. And then their mother walks in. I can't believe you ate the cake, she yells. I gave you one thing to do, one thing. Furious, she kicks them out of the kitchen. The kids then tear out of the house fast, running away from their mother's wrath, but laughing through their cake-encrusted faces. And as angry as the mother is at her kids, she can't help herself. As the children run outside in the cold, crisp air, she follows them, calling after them as they run down the sidewalk. And here, don't forget your jackets. It's cold out there. So why did Jesus break the rules? Someone needed to be healed. Why does God still care about us, even though we have been breaking his rules since forever? Someone needed to be loved. Amen. their vehicles, their boats, and 
truly their spirits. The two firefighters who were injured but not doing well. And the 20 year employer, employee of the boatyard, Phil. Phil McCumber is his name. And he's still recovering in the hospital from some burns as he was pulled out of the fire by a, a fellow employee. These things are not on the news, but they're becoming more and more public through social media and whatnot. And certainly we want to lift up the Kaiser family, Dave and Jen, and their kids. And they wanted me to be sure to mention that the McLean family uh, has a long history with the boatyard as well, Art and Alberta McLean. So keep them in your prayers. The first thing that happens in these times is communities pull together. And then we want to say, what can we do? What can we do as a church? And in these days of technology, about the best thing that we can do as individuals is give to the relief of those who are affected by this. Now there are two GoFundMe pages. Just go to GoFundMe.com, find, just type in Mana Poison and you'll come to it. One is for Phil McCumber's medical bills and, and future, as he will probably not be employable for a while. And when I looked at that GoFundMe page this morning to make sure it was still active, they were trying to, uh, I guess, raise like 30000 and it was already at 63000 or something. So if you know him uh, or just want to donate to him, uh, to his bills, uh, that's a GoFundMe page. And there's also a GoFundMe page for the relief for Mana Poison, Boatyard Fire. Okay, and the person who started that GoFundMe page is a close friend of their of the, uh, family of the Kaisers and has said uh, that they'll make sure, you know, solemnly swear to make sure that they get to where it's needed first. Um, so GoFundMe, uh, talking with Jen from our finance committee before worship today, uh, it's probably the best way to go right now. So people can, can have access to those funds as soon as they're needed. And of course, we lift up all of these families and those affected in prayer and ask you to include them. Additionally, we lift up prayers for a 15-year-old girl, Natalie, who just recently had a cancer diagnosis. And we lift up in prayer Sue Shelley's and her family. She is now a 26-time great-grandmother, as David James Knight was welcomed to the world. So, prayers of joy for that. Are there other who wish to lift up the names of those for whom we should be praying in our prayers this week? Then let us come to God in prayer. O well, faithful God, here we are praying for faith, fully aware that it takes faith to pray. So what should we say? Must we ask for more faith? Can there be only a little faith? Or are not all attempts to quantify faith ridiculous? Isn't faith like life in the sense that we either have it or we don't? Deliver us from confusion, O God. Help us to know the difference between faith and make-believe, faith and imagination, faith and optimism, between faith and magic. Prevent us from turning faith into a means of escape from life, an excuse for ignorance, or a rationale for inactivity. Right now, Lord, we want faith, mature faith. Where faith is not existence, send your spirit to move in the void, much like your spirit moved over the face of the deep at the beginning. Strike a spark of interest in faith within us. 
compel a decision regarding faith from us. Nurture the exercise of faith by us. Where faith already exists, deepen it. Nurture our faith, O oh God, by enlightening our minds, by sensitizing our emotions, by increasing our actions, by strengthening our wills, and by making complete our obedience to you. We long for faith with a passion akin to that of a loving mother searching for a lost child. We hunger and thirst for faith the way people deprived of food and drink seek sustenance. God grant us faith. Allow faith to be born in us, to grow in us, and to find expression through us. Fill our faith with joy and certainty. Excitement as if this were the first day of our Christian pilgrimage and conviction as if it were the last. And God, we know that when there's tragedy, you are the first one to weep. We pray that you be with us in our loss, in our grief, that you hold in your loving hands the Kaisers, the claims, fill all those affected by the fire on Friday. We pray that they may know your presence with them, that they will know our presence for them and the support that we pledge to give them. All these things we pray in the name of the pioneer of our faith as well as its author and finisher, Jesus Christ. Hear us as we pray to you using one voice, the words he taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, all that we have and all that we are, even life itself, is a gift from our Creator. Let us respond to God's generosity now with our morning offering. Giving 
and for living. Amen.